live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering IBM Think 2018. Brought to you by IBM. Hello and welcome to theCUBE here in IBM Think 2018. I'm John Furrier. It's theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. We're the number one live event coverage. We're, we're here at theCUBE with IBM Think 2018. And next guest is Jesse Lund, who's the vice president of IBM Blockchain. He's on the financial services side into blockchain, into crypto, into token economics, seeing the future, how money flows. Jesse, great to have you on theCUBE, thanks sure, for joining yeah, me. Yeah, thanks for having me, it's great So to we were talking before on camera um, um, about blockchain, we love blockchain. IBM certainly put it out there as part of the innovation sandwich. Blockchain, data, AI, kind of making that innovation. Right. But it's really what it enables that I want to talk to you about. Right. You are involved in payments, We've been saying on theCUBE that the, the killer app is money I agree. in this market. Yeah. You agree and you talk about it. Yeah. This is a, a new market, so a stack is kind of developing. You got blockchain, you got, then you got crypto, which has protocols, and you got infrastructure, then you got decentralized applications, which you could call ICOs up top, certainly a little bit scammy and bubbly, but yeah. That's just arbitraging and optimizing the capital markets. Right. You could argue that. But so, this is a really big dynamic. Your thoughts and, uh, on this trend. Sure, well, um, so I, I joined IBM from you know, 18 years at, uh, at Wells Fargo. So, um, spent really the, the majority of my career in financial services, and when blockchain came along, I sort of immediately saw the, the impact, the potential for, I'll call it positive disruption, disruption in the positive sense transformational paradigm shift kind of stuff in, in terms of how money moves around the world and how we, how we classify um, assets and how we transfer ownership of assets. I mean, that, that's just, it's, the, the, the possibilities are, are limitless. And you're right, um, IBM is the place where I think blockchain has started as a, a mainstream focus for enterprises around you know, building private networks, but that's really just the beginning. What we talked about earlier was, yeah. it gets really interesting when data and money are connected together and they move at high velocities well, together. Let's get into that. I mean, first, let's just address the IBM thing. They got to put a stake in the ground, blockchain. It's a safe harbor to say supply chain stuff because that's their business. They've right. been building yep. technologies right. for supply chains right. for companies. That's what enterprises do, that's yep. IBM. Yep. But the game is where the money is and that's where the businesses are going to be transformed. We're talking about disrupting you know, structural industries. Yeah. This is where the money power comes in. So money's flowing. I mean, if you want to move money from China, go to Bitcoin. You want to move it from anywhere, this is what's happening. Right. Yeah, so, bit, so think about Bitcoin. Um, it's kind of what started it all. It's, uh, it's a little bit of a bad word in, in banks and in you know, regulated financial circles, but let's face it, the only real mainstream blockchain application today is still Bitcoin. But you know, we're only three years into the blockchain industry, right? I mean, think about when we were three years into the internet industry, you know, where we were still talking about which browser is going to win, and then it went on to yeah. you know, which application server is going to win, and it wasn't until a decade later we were really focused on what are the applications, the killer apps that are enabled by an interconnected world, and that's exactly what's happening now. So other industries have already yeah. been completely disrupted. Look at retail. It's just, it's banking's turn. It's financial One of the services founders, turn. The co-founders of Ethereum, uh, Anthony DeLorio, who I interviewed uh, a couple weeks ago at behind the Obama's, he said, wallet is the new browser. To your point, it's browser good, yeah. wars. If you think about the payment, wallets are now becoming part of the mechanism. Right for money transfer, yeah. if you don't have a wallet, if you want to send me some Ripple, you want right. to send me some Ethereum, right. I need a wallet. Right, yeah. So this has, this is a no brainer, right? I mean, if you want <laughs> to leverage any money, that's yeah. one thing. And the second thing I want to get your thoughts on is besides a wallet is the fiat conversion. Yeah. Right? So these are two threshold conversations that are going on. Your thoughts, wallet and conversion to fiat. Well, I mean, I think wallets are really important because this whole thing is based on you know, key management. This whole concept is based on cryptography, right? So, so it only works on a, a public-private key you know, notion, and you got to keep that private key private, but you got to keep it, right? And you got to keep it safe, and you got to keep it. It's like your wallet. You've got a wallet, you've got cash in your wallet, you lose your wallet, you lose your cash. It's yeah. the same kind of analogy. So wallets are, are really important, and you're going to want to turn to providers who, who have made their business in um, encryption, who have made their business in, yeah. in security. Yeah, I mean, cold storage, old school's kind of coming back. People are taking totally their, their back, keys yeah. and they're spreading them across multiple lock boxes, multiple states. Right. People are getting broken into their house, or their PCs are getting broken into. Right. 
Yeah. I it, mean, yeah. Security. Yeah. So going old school. Yeah. And 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 why not? I mean, you know, it works. If right? someone knows you got a hundred million dollars in your house, <laughs> they're gonna get it. Yeah. Yeah. You don't lock it. Okay. Back to the reality yeah. of the money transfer. So we were talking before you came on, I've been saying on theCUBE, token economics really is where the action is, at least in my opinion. Yeah. I want to get your thoughts. Because really the business model innovation is on the table because whoever can innovate the business model has more of a chance to disrupt an existing industry. Yeah. So this is where tokenization becomes part of the money piece of it. So how do you convert that value into capture? Right. So, I is that mean, token? Is that where you see it? What's your thoughts? Yeah. So, well, first of all, I mean, if you think of you know um, tokens as a, another form of, of currency, and by the way, I, you know, I think we have to be careful about what we say. Cryptocurrencies. The industry talks about you know thousands of cryptocurrencies out there, where there's there's really not. There's maybe you know dozens, and they're all derivatives of of you know of just a few uh, models. Bitcoin being one you know one prominent model, and there's a lot of offshoots off of that. Um, but the rest of what we call crypto Cryptocurrencies are really tokens that represent primarily securities, right? Which is why the SEC is getting involved. But the really interesting thing about this is these tokens move at high velocity because they're they're digital, right? And so, but these digital things represent a claim on real world value, and that's where it becomes really interesting. So IBM's built and launched um, as kind of its first foray into the solution space of financial services, where IBM is a, an investor in this technology, a, a um, cross-border payment solution that inherently re-engineers this whole correspondent banking, this international wire process, and where FX, foreign exchange, becomes a real-time capability in a, a, a series of operations that execute as an atomic unit. That doesn't, that's, that's novel today, right? When you want to send money from here to somewhere else in the world, you go to your bank, your bank sends an instruction to another bank, um, and they respond and say, yeah, you know, it's okay because the person you're sending it to is not a terrorist, is not on a, you know, some kind of sanctions list, great. Now the bank has to actually go settle, and it settles through another network. So the novelty is, why can't the messages and the, the data and the value itself, the, the, the digital asset, why can't they exist and move together at the same time? And so that's what we've really built. But as we've built and deployed that and, and are, are getting banks and non-bank financial institutions to, to sign up for it because the cost of moving money goes way, way, way down and the user experience goes way, way, way up because instead of taking two or three days and you don't know how much it's going to cost until it gets there, it takes, you know, 10 or 15 seconds and you know before you even press send how much it's going to cost yeah. to get there. And it all boils down to this notion of digital assets. That's what it all comes down to is the way to settle value with finality in real time is for one party to exchange a digital asset with another party. Today, initially, the only form of negotiable digital assets are cryptocurrencies, which has banks a little scared. But as we start talking through what we've learned in the enterprise blockchain space, we realize that we can tokenize all sorts of other asset classes, commodities, securities, um, and even fiat currencies, right, where central banks or commercial banks can issue uh, a token that represents a claim of on deposits held at some financial institution. And that's, that's So you amazing. see tokenization as a big deal? It's a huge deal. It's, I mean, it's everything. It's I think the economic it's, value of the... Of right. the I think it's the tipping point for, for blockchain. I think it's, you know, and it, the, the irony is it goes back to Bitcoin kind of started this all, you know, and we said, well, we like the idea of the technology underneath Bitcoin, and but we want to focus on blockchain. I mean, forget for a sec that blockchain is actually terminology that's invented by the Bitcoin primer that was published nine years ago, right, yeah, by yeah. Satoshi. So, yeah, so it's their, it's whoever they are, it's yeah. their terminology. And it's kind of coming back full circle where yeah. you're seeing the convergence of all of these cool optimization capabilities, you know, uh, immutability and workflow, you know, optimization. And there's a lot of management. work to be done on performance and whatnot, but the concept of decentralized yeah. immutability d data is, is fine. Yeah. Store the data. Now, there's, if it got, it's got to get fixed. But I think that what that enables, and I think you agree, the tokenization is critical. So for a company that wants to token their business or raise money via tokens or get involved in this new economic value creation right. innovation trend, yeah. How do they do it? And, and by the way, are there tools available? You mentioned banking, and the banking business got to where it was because you had to build the picks and shovels to make it happen. Right. Was, you had to do a swift, and you had to have this stuff go on. Yeah. Now, you, developers don't necessarily have the tools. Right. So there's a picks and shovel market, and there's also the real innovation. 
Yeah, and, I, and that's, I think, the value contribution that IBM brings, right? I mean, we bring 107 years of, of credibility in, in developing and operating you know, mission-critical transactional financial systems, and I could do just an ad for a second. That's what the, the IBM blockchain platform is all about. And as the industry evolves, as our a platform offering evolves, what we want to be able to bring to small business, medium-sized businesses, large businesses, is the ability to develop solutions using our toolkit. Okay, so Jesse, I want you to, to put Put your um, financial hat on, yeah. at the same time put your payments hat on, yeah. and your token economics hat on, <laughs> three hats. Hey, I want to I want to tokenize my business. Right. I really want to get in. So we have an innovative team, we're seeing new business model formulas and logic that we want to disrupt. Right. What do I do? I got an existing growing business that I know has assets, and I'm not a startup, but I'm not trying to pivot like uh, Kodak. Right. Um, so, <laughs> you know, there's, I'm not dying throwing the Hail Mary, right. where I'm not a startup, I've got to build a whole product. I'm a real business, right. I'm growing, and I, I see tokenization as a way for me to be successful. Yeah. What do I do? What's your advice? Well, so I, I think um, you look at it from, from all you know, potential angles. If you look at any business, they're always looking to improve the bottom line by shrinking you know, cost, right? They're also looking to improve the bottom line by, by uh, increasing the top side, right? Increasing revenue. And I think as a mid-sized business or a growing business, you have the opportunity to use tokenization, to use blockchain and digital currencies to do both of those things. So you have the ability to, to accelerate um, the adoption of whatever your good or service or product is by if it's tokenizable, and most things are, whether it's a utility access to some service you provide or whether it's an asset, some widget that you sell, you enable you know, um, primary and secondary markets by creating a digital asset that can be bought by anybody anywhere around the world. I mean, that's, that's one way uh, to do it. And I, so I think, Getting people to There's realize some, you the gotta, potential you gotta there. So you got to call up IBM or get some developers, make it happen. Yeah. Okay, so killer apps money, that's going to be a 30 plus year trend. Yep. And certainly this highlights that. But the other thing that's happened is coming out of either the, and the open source community as well as um, uh, cloud, right. the notion of marketplaces and communities. Yeah. So marketplaces and communities become a very important role in the token economics yeah. piece. What's your thoughts and uh, opinion on that, on that narrative? Well, again, for me, it goes back, you know, I, I always go back to, to digital assets, right? And, and uh, we in, in the U.S. and around the world, when we start talking about financial instruments, we, we classify assets uh, differently. But when it comes to an ecosystem and a, and a community that becomes inherently peer-to-peer -peer and inherently democratic, it's, it's about a, an asset class agnostic distributed exchange where I can sell you my security token in exchange for your fiat token or I can sell you my commodity token and utility token for the same. So I think the ecosystem gets built um, automatically by way of um, new assets coming to a common network or interoperable set of networks. And that's what's missing today, by the way, say in, in capital markets, right? The holy grail in the capital market space today is how do I shrink the, the time between trade and settlement? You know, so this is whole like T plus three and we're spending billions of dollars to go to T plus two, we, we gain a day. So the trade day and the settlement date are, are two days apart. I mean, you, you just think about kind of the absurdity of that. You yeah. know, if you just say, well, if the security that you're buying is a digital asset, and the money that you're buying it with is a digital asset, and they both you know, exist on either the same network or an interoperable network, the transfer of ownership and the transfer of value happen together as two operations or a single operation in one atomic transaction, you've solved the problem. You've light, solved- Speed of light can make it happen. Right, delivery versus payment. That's what the capital markets you know, industry is trying to optimize for, right? Because it improves the balance sheet of, you know, of, of, of all sorts of um, uh, you had, a, you had a phrase you mentioned before we came on camera, something about money, the future of money. Um, what was that what was the uh, phrase? Pro programmable money? Programmable money. Yeah, right, right. I want you to take a minute to explain. Love this concept. Yeah. Mikos Matsumura, a thought leader, a friend of ours, has a, a vision called open source money, yeah. which is more of an open source thing. Hey, money's flowing, right. it's open, it's out there. But you have right. a different perspective, which I like too, which is programmable money. What does right. that mean? Yeah. Describe the concept and take a minute to, yeah. to unpack that. So, um, so the, the concept of programmable money comes out of a, a paper that I jointly authored with Jed McCaleb, who is the founder of Stellar and was the co-founder of Ripple and is a really smart guy. So I feel like I have a small brain when I'm around him. But um, we really wrote it in the context of central banking. 
and the ultimate issuer of an asset, because central banks are the issuers of, of currencies. And right now, the primary dealers, if you will, for currencies are commercial banks. And so that whole commercial, central, you know, fractional reserve banking model has been replicated from you know, the Western world to everywhere else in the world. Um, and you can't get access to central bank money, as they say. Um, but if the central banks were to issue digital currencies, which is essentially a token of fiat currency, right? So you own the token, you own a claim of fiat deposits held on the balance sheet of the central bank. Now you have the ability to move that around. You can actually program the movement of money because it's a digital thing, it's a digital asset that's as good as cash. And if you are working with a central bank who's issuing it, not only is it electronic money, it's actually legal tender. Because if the central bank issues it, it becomes legal tender, which means everybody who accepts it has to accept that form of, of yeah. payment, right? That's, that's pretty profound if we can get to that point. And we're working with- And software is a big driver in that because you need software to manage digital assets. Oh, uh, yeah, so, absolutely. So software's driving it. Right. Bill Tai um, is an investor, I, I interviewed him, and he had an interesting topic, he, and I made a uh, highlight of it. He said during, well, after World War II, we're talking about you know, the oil situation, yeah. when the dollar was pegged to OPEC, that was essentially tokenizing oil. Right. So, and then, okay, that's good. That, so, that was their ICO. Right, right, so, right. yeah, essentially. So that's what you're saying. You can actually put fiat to the digital token. Right. And take advantage of the efficiencies of digital. Right. Yeah, okay. Taking down all the structural inefficiencies that were built prior to digital. Is that? It is. All right, well, so you're, you know, so you fast forward a little bit and, and think where that takes us. So um, it's no secret that the U.S. dollar is the trade currency of the world. And I want to be careful what I say because you know I'm a I'm an American patriot here, yeah. but there are other large you know G20 nations who wouldn't mind dethroning the U.S. dollar as the as the trade currency of the world. And so as you see central banks starting to get involved in the issuance of digital currency, you you know you create a situation where all of a sudden, well, maybe oil could be traded, heresy, mm -hmm. in other currencies besides the U.S. dollar, which is all it's traded in well, today. We're it goes to back to your ecosystem question. Well, no, this right? is a great point. This is, we could talk, look and riff on this, double, let's riff on this. Does the U.K. just sign a deal with Coinbase? This is a major it, yeah. signal. You had a legitimate <laughs> country saying, we're going to give a license right. to Coinbase. Right. Now, they have Brexit to deal with, so they're looking at it as an opportunity. Right. Outside of the UK coming in and doing that deal with Coinbase, it's on the web, look up Coinbase in the UK, you'll see the deal. Yep. You have other companies trying to jockey for who's going to be the Wall Street for crypto. Right. Meaning, I want to convert crypto to fiat. Where do I go? Do I go to Estonia? Do I go to Dubai? Bahrain? Armenia? Right. China? There is no place yet. Right. Your thoughts, Where's, what's going to happen? What shoe will drop first? Is there, is there a domino effect? Yeah, well, there, well there's a couple of things uh, as it relates to the, um, the, the UK and you know, kind of the extension to Coinbase of access to the national payment system, which is really what enables them to then convert you know, fiat to crypto and back. Um, that, that's, that's pretty interesting. Going back to the programmable money thing though, if you have a, a central bank issued token, you've essentially extended the real-time gross settlement system which has been only accessible by commercial banks to anybody that holds that token, right? So it's a trend. I think the UK sees it coming. I think the Federal Reserve sees it sees it coming. You know, it, it's is it winner happen. take all or winner take most? I I think um, it creates a, a a much more kind of purely efficient uh, market, right? That's really what the, it's a democratic yeah. system. So yeah. I don't think there is going to be a new Wall Street. I think it's going to be decentralized. Uh, exactly. I mean, that's the beauty. So of, smart. It's city. scary though for establishments like yeah, Wall Street to look at this. And it, I mean, it, are the banks scared? You, you're dealing with the banks right now. They're scared. I mean, I, I actually read a, a recent article that you know Bank of America. You know, the headline was Bank of America is afraid of, of digital currency. You've seen you know Jamie Dimon who came out with a kind of a hard stance against Bitcoin and has, has since kind of backed away from that. Of course, that. he probably bought in when it dropped and right, now it's back right, up again. Right, yeah. right, <laughs> right. Well, I think part of, part of the, the bank was actually facilitating their clients in trading yeah, Bitcoin, yeah, so yeah, that yeah. might have been <laughs> something. But, you know, I mean, there's a natural reaction to it, especially if you're part of the By mainstream the way, no establishment. Proof of that. I'm just saying, saying what yeah, people yeah. are seeing on Reddit. No, we're just joking around. Yeah. Uh, Jamie's a, he's a good guy, right? So, so uh, I want to get your thoughts on digital nations. So we've been uh, talking about this. You know, just a few years ago, smart cities, IOT was kind of the narrative. Oh, it'd be a smart city, right. control the traffic lights, and you know, instrument the right. physical goods and, and services. Now, with crypto and blockchain, front and center conversation is digital nations with sovereignty around their cash. Right. This is kind of to your point earlier. 
How are you seeing that? What's your view? Are you seeing that trend? Are there dots connecting for you? Because again, people are jockeying for a position on the global digital backbone to be a major part of yeah. the money flow. Right. The fiat conversion, what is the goods and services? Who's going to clear the value? It's all digital. Right. It's a perfect storm. Right. Well, I think there's, there's always going to be the need for um, you know, for trusted entities to be the issuers of these assets, because it, it all comes down to trust at, at the end of the day, right? And so, um, the, the thing with Bitcoin is that it's you know purely autonomous, and people are a little bit skeptical of it because they're like, well, who's mm -hmm. controlling the monetary policy? And the answer is the market, the, you know, the users of the network are controlling it, um, and that's why you see such volatility, right? Because the traders love it. You know, they can go in and, and trade the uptrends and the downtrends. As long as there's volatility, traders are making money. And so I think there is still going to be a place for central authorities to, to add value, but that's going to be the pressure is for them to prove that they're adding value, not you know bureaucracy masquerading as process. Right? So I was reading an article that Telegram, which is doing a huge ICO, yeah. just got shut down by the Russian government. Right. They wanted to turn over their keys, their, <laughs> pri their private keys of, of right. their users. Right. I mean, he'll, you know, say goodbye to the- I didn't read that, that's crazy. Uh, <laughs> it's really crazy. So that's going to put a damper in the ICO, but right. regulatory and then you know, government issues around countries becomes a big deal. In your experience as Wells Fargo, as in a bank, looking forward in the new digital world, yeah. um, is it, a, is it a, 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 one of those situations where path of least resistance, the countries that are more friendly, get around that? You know, sovereignty, where you domicile, where you start your company, where you do your banking. Right. I mean, I could, bank, I could start a company in Gibraltar and bank in Switzerland. Yeah. So, well, transparency is part of the, you know, the benefit or the downside of this, right? And so I think there may be advantages that pop up, but I think they will, they will equalize over time. Um, you know, I, I, I've been around the world now um, for IBM talking to 20 plus central banks, and I had a really interesting conversation with one of them recently in, in, in Asia. And you know we're in the room with you know uh, uh, deputy director level people um, who are responsible for things like the anti money laundering policy and and the economics and monetary policy and and things like that. And um, one person said, you know we're really uh, we're torn between you know two equally unacceptable decisions. One is to ignore cryptocurrencies altogether and the other end of the spectrum is to, to make them illegal, to ban them. And I thought it was poignant that, um, that they see those as, as um, unacceptable. They have to do something yeah. in the middle. Do they um, wait or ban? I mean, look at it, the banning's happening. But, 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 but okay, so you, know, so you saw Trump use the executive order to, uh, to prevent Americans from using uh, or trading in the Venezuelan crypto that was issued on, on Ethereum, right? And, I saw that Venezuelan thing as a publicity stunt more than anything, or an act of, uh, of, of global defiance. Um, but so there's precedent now yeah. for, and the I Russian mean, and thing- the United with, with States Telegram. of America has to step up its game because, right. you know, look at, we have a lot of, I mean, I remember back in the crypto days when I was in just getting into the business in the late 80s, early 90s, you couldn't even do it in the US, you go to Canada. Right. So that's why Canada's got a lot of innovation up there. But, you know, we're, we're risking our country, and I had one guy tell me in Puerto Rico, he's from South Africa, and he shouldn't be throwing any stones either, but his point was, he says, America's becoming Europe. <laughs> There's a shrinking middle class, yeah. while other emerging markets have a growing middle class, so right. the global impact of, of blockchain, cryptocurrency, and these applications are significant, right. and have to be factored into policy decision making yeah. for governments. The U.S. can't just think about itself right. anymore in a vacuum. Right, not Because anymore. there's implications, otherwise the U.S. will turn into Europe. Yeah. Regulated, all these rules, Byzantine stuff. I mean, it's a real problem. It Your is. thoughts on that? Yeah, well, um, I mean, you know, it's cliche, but we, we live and, and work in a global economy, right? The flow of information globally in real time has been around now for a while. Yeah and it's about time it came to money. You know, The internet of money is a, is a term I've heard. It, it's just, it's unavoidable. Um, Jesse Lund here inside theCUBE, great guest, great conversation. Yeah, thanks. Um, how do people get a hold of you on IBM's, you mentioned you got some great stuff going on, you've written a paper, uh, you got a lot of content. Where does someone go to discover 
some of the stuff you're working on that can get involved with you guys? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the best place to go is ibm.com slash blockchain. Uh, that'll, that'll tell you a lot about what we're, what we're doing. And, and the, the programmable industry. money paper you wrote, is it's, that there? It's out there as well. There's on a link IBM. to that. Com? Yeah, you can get me directly on LinkedIn. I try to be pretty responsive with that because I really enjoy the dialogue. This, yeah. is, a, <laughs> this is a revolution yeah. of the peoples, man. It's a, a, all over the world, so yeah. it's great. It's yeah. great to be a part of it. And people are tokenizing their businesses, real opportunities to change the game, to bring consensus, data-driven, new kind of supply chain, whatever, to the markets you're in. Great effort, and you, got, and you need banking. Yeah, of you course. You need to have money. Right, right. Money, marketplaces, and communities. That's my, that's my, my mantra. I, 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 Thanks I for coming on. I subscribe to it. Thank you. Thanks for okay. having me. Jesse Appreciate Lund, it. I'm John Furrier here at IBM. Think 2018, CUBE coverage continues after this short break. <laughs>